Hi, I'm Dr. Andrea Rapkin from UCLA, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Today I'm going to talk with you about a condition called vulvodynia. We're going to discuss current trends, treatment, and some of my research that may be helpful for all of you that are interested. If you'd like to ask questions, you can use the Twitter hashtag noted here. This is what we'll be talking about this morning. I'm going to go into some detail about what actually is vulvodynia, the symptoms of the disorder, causes, the treatments that are currently available, our research and other current research, and then we'll take questions. So what is vulvodynia? First of all, what is the vulva? The vulva is made up of the external female genital organs that you can see in this picture here. And it, the condition of vulvodynia is a chronic pain condition. It affects the vulva and the opening of the vagina. Approximately 7 to 14 percent of women in the U.S. suffer from vulvar and vaginal pain. And vulvodynia can affect women of all ages, really. There are two general types, but as with any categorizing system, there's often some uh, flow between the two disorders. So very often we'll have women who have both generalized vulvodynia as well as vestibulodynia, or may have um, generalized at one time, and then uh, this may develop into a vestibulodynia condition. So generalized mean that the pain is located in different areas of the vulva. It may be the whole vulvar area. It may be uh, on the larger lips of the vulva. Uh, in contrast with vestibulodynia, and I'll show you the picture again shortly, where the pain is localized to the vestibule. Now, in generalized vulvodynia, the pain may come and go, or it may be constant. It may be felt just with contact, for example, with sitting, with clothing, uh, with touch, or it may be also unprovoked, and of course can be both. Now with vestibulodynia, the pain is localized to the vestibule. The term vestibule is similar to the vestibule or entranceway of a house, for example, and I'll show you the vestibule in a moment. The pain is usually a burning pain, and it's usually felt with contact only, but can also be unprovoked. Here's the vestibule, and it is bordered by these small lips of the vagina, and here's the urethral opening in this part this mucous membrane tissue is considered to be the vestibule. And as I said, the most common symptom of vulvodynia and vestibulodynia is this burning pain. What else can women feel? Itching, stinging, aching, rawness, tenderness. Now, the vulva generally appears normal, although there may be some increase in redness in this area here of the vestibule. What are the causes? Well, I wish we could say we knew exactly what causes vulvodynia. We'd be much further along in research and treatment. But we don't exactly know what causes vulvodynia, and likely there's more than one cause. Some possible contributing factors that have research to support these concepts include an increased number of little nerve endings in the vulvar tissue, particularly in the vestibule, where this has been studied. Changes in hormones or hormone receptors in the tissues, and by hormones we're talking about estrogen and androgens like testosterone, and yes, women do make androgens, testosterone. Uh, increased inflammatory secretions in the tissues, so there could be, uh, or there have been found to be inflammation uh, cells, inflammatory cells increased in the tissue, and some mediators of inflammation that are increased in the uh, vestibular tissue. Now, the pelvic floor, these are the muscles that line the vagina, that hold everything up. There can be pelvic floor muscle weakness, but more interestingly, spasm. So spasm or tenderness or inappropriate tightness and contraction is something that can be very problematic in this disorder. And some of the work that we're doing now has to do with the brain. And we, there are many studies showing changes in brain processing of pain signals from the vaginal area. I'm going to go into some of that shortly. Sadly, women see an average of five doctors before being correctly diagnosed. Now, how do we make a diagnosis of vulvodynia? The doctor will take a thorough health history, including all the symptoms and the aggravating and alleviating factors and what led up to the problem that you're having. 
Uh, we then look at the tissue because we want to rule out any other types of treatable conditions that are not specifically vulvodynia. So we're looking for changes in the skin. We're looking for inflammatory conditions that are not related to vulvodynia. We're looking for infection, uh, vaginal infections, vulvar infections. <clears throat> and we're looking then for other possible causes of pain, such as when the nerve endings um, in the nerves that go down to the vulvar tissues uh, become activated. So we're looking for neuropathies, neuropathies of a nerve called the pudendal nerve, for example. <clears throat> the doctor will then perform a Q-tip test. And the Q-tip test is a situation where we take the Q-tip, uh, which is very soft on the end, and apply a light pressure to the areas around the vestibule and other areas of the vulva. Now, when you touch the vestibule with a cotton swab with light pressure, it is generally not significantly painful. But if you have a significant or severe pain with touching the vestibule, for example, that would be consistent with vestibulodynia. A pelvic exam and pelvic floor muscle exam then completes the assessment. OK, let's talk about some of the current treatment approaches that we have. Um, Interestingly, as with any chronic pain condition, treatment is often what we call multimodal or multi-platform. So it's not just one avenue that's taken for the treatment. Removing potential irritants, and I'll go into detail about all of these shortly. Topical medications that can be applied to the painful area. Physical therapy for those pelvic floor muscles we talked about. There are also oral medications that are prescribed that alter nerve firing and get the nerves to go from the bad side back to the good side. Uh, Cognitive-based therapies, and including mindfulness approaches, and surgery. OK, what do we mean by irritants? Why would a soap be irritating? I've used this soap for years, and suddenly it's irritating. Well, that may be the case. Just because you've been using a particular product doesn't mean you can't now have developed what we would consider a contact dermatitis-like situation or that if the tissue is becoming more sensitive, that the product you're using isn't irritating. The most offending agents are usually our soaps, any colored or scented soap, strong detergents, fabric softeners, even those fabric softener sheets that go in the dryer, certain lubricants that are not um, um, scent-free, bubble baths, of course, and bath oils. We suggest you wear comfortable underwear, cotton, um, panty liners, very often, of course, for sanitary uh, protection during menstruation, this may be necessary, but it is not a good idea to wear these uh, panty liners every day. They are very irritating. And then we want to avoid potential mechanical trauma, such as what's lift listed here, underwear, tight-fitting jeans, etc. Okay, what types of topical medications are available? We use anesthetic and anticonvulsant creams for this condition, and I'll explain to you why. Uh, the anesthetic is not just to relieve pain, but these anesthetics, such as lidocaine, have certain chemical properties that block chemicals in the upregulated or hyperactive nerve. So they're, again, re-educating the nerve. They're not just used to treat pain or mask pain. So lidocaine is used topically. And similarly, gabapentin, which is an anticonvulsant, also alters the way nerves are firing when they're firing abnormally. And this can be compounded to a cream so that you avoid some of the systemic effects. There are other types of medications that we may also put in compounded creams, but these are the two that have been studied for vulvodynia and vestibulodynia. Now, if we ascertain that there's a deficiency of hormones, either related to long-term low-dose uh, birth control pill usage, which certainly doesn't affect everyone in this way, or other hormone uh, birth control approaches that could lower estrogen and testosterone, or if we have someone who is in the perimenopausal years, or even in the um, postpartum time with lactation, there can be a decrease in estrogen, we may then provide a hormone-based cream uh, with estrogen and occasionally with testosterone to help supplement the thin tissue. The oral medications, again, I'm talking about medications that are going to re-educate the way nerves are firing. So this is the goal of something like a tricyclic antidepressant. 
you may not be depressed. That's not the reason we're providing a tricyclic in this setting. It's really to work on the nerve endings. And these are some of the tricyclics that are available. And by the way, they're used for other types of nerve pain problems and pain problems in general. And with vulvodynia, very often there are other pain problems concurrently, such as migraines or other types of headaches, irritable bowel syndrome, bladder pain syndrome, fibromyalgia. And using a systemic medication can approach all of these conditions. Now, when would we choose a TCA over an SNRI or an SSRI? There's slightly different side effect profiles. Also, if there is depression or anxiety, we may be more likely to choose an SNRI or an SSRI so that we can treat that as well. Um, anticonvulsants, I began to mention with uh, the gabapentin, but there are other anticonvulsants that can also be used. Again, medications in the same grouping may have different effects and different side effects, so we may try one or another of these. Physical therapy. Most of the patients that I see who do have vulvodynia and vestibulodynia, either primarily or secondarily, meaning it may be the cause of the symptoms initially or it may be a consequence of the symptoms, develop pelvic floor muscle dysfunction. And there are trained physical therapists, and for women we have female physical therapists, that manually teach how to relax the tight muscles and tissues and work with the abnormal tissue in the pelvic floor. And then patients also learn breathing techniques and relaxation techniques so that they can do these stretches and exercises at home. And sometimes partners are taught the techniques as well. Sometimes we use dilators in conjunction with the PT so that you can remember to learn how to relax while there's a structure inside. The cognitive therapies are really to change our fearful and anxious thoughts about the pain that we're having and to improve self-efficacy. That's a term that means that we really know we're going to get better. And there are often doubts when we're in the midst of this pain about whether we will get better. But because as the physician we know you will, we have to try to teach you to teach your brain how to remind you of this. And that's basically what cognitive behavioral therapy does. Mindfulness also helps to restructure the way the brain is conceptualizing pain. And then, of course, sometimes we have sex and, and couples therapy, if that's indicated. Managing anxiety and depression, which may be subsequent to the pain or may have occurred prior to the pain, is also important. Now, when would we do surgery? Surgery seems like a quick, quick fix. Why not operate all the time? Well, first of all, it has to be localized to the vestibule, the pain. But second of all, vestibulectomy um, may cause more pain in certain situations. So the doctor has to be very sure that this is appropriate for you. And in general, whenever we're proposing surgery, we want to make sure that you've tried other reasonable treatments and that they haven't worked. And then we can remove the sensitive tissue, the hypersensitive tissue, I should say, around the opening of the vagina to remove what may be excess nerve endings that contribute to the pain. Unfortunately, in one individual, we cannot take a biopsy and say, you have excess nerve endings. So that's why we need to make sure that this is the right surgery for you. I'm going to tell you a little bit now about some current research that we're doing at UCLA in conjunction with the Center for the Neurobiology of Stress. Uh, we're collaborating in what's called an MRI endophenotype clinical study. And I'm going to tell you what that means shortly. Uh, with this study, we are hoping to learn a number of things. Number one, we'd like to be able to use brain imaging to find effective treatments that target specific pain findings. So what I've mentioned to you are a number of treatments and the, that the exam is somewhat nonspecific. So how do I know when I examine one individual which treatment to start with? And do we really have to go through all those treatments before we actually find something that's really going to work very effectively? This is the goal of the, of the study, is to be able to hone our treatments so that we know what is specific for you. So brain imaging, that's one approach. And when you can see that there are certain abnormalities that we may find in the study, this may lead us to future treatments for vulvodynia. So if we understand the mechanism behind the different presentations and symptoms, then we can have what we call mechanism-based treatment or mechanistic treatment. So what kinds of mechanisms are we looking at? 
besides the brain. We're looking at genetics because certain individuals may have changes, slight changes in their genes that mean that certain proteins are a little different. And maybe they predispose you to inflammation or to alterations in the way that nerve endings are functioning. And we're also looking at the microbiome. You've heard that quite a bit in the news. The bacteria that live in the vagina and the vulvar area and metabolome, which are the products of these uh, microbiome, um, uh, microbiota, I, I should say. And these products can get into the bloodstream and can certainly affect the brain. And we're looking to see what is unique to the vulva. So what is an endophenotype actually? You can see the, in, the uh, definition here. We're looking at the behaviors and characteristics of a condition that have a clear genetic connection. And they're more often found in individuals with a particular syndrome than in the, gen than in the general population. And many of these endophenotypes may be even present before symptoms appear. So they're helping us not only to uh, search for the cause, but also to help with uh, treatment. I mentioned that metabolomics are these products from the bacteria, and they basically are chemical fingerprints of cellular processes. And then the MRI means magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, this is not an x-ray. This is just a magnetic imaging. And it is not um, something that is, uh, has the same side effect or harm effect as an x-ray, for example. But it does give us a clear picture of organs and structures in the body. And right now, what we're talking about is the brain. So what is our study involved? It does mean coming to UCLA. Um, we do not, uh, unfortunately, have funds to provide um, transportation to UCLA, however, from across the country, for example. Two visits to UCLA, one week apart. And we do a pelvic examination, and we do some very specific sensory testing of the vulvar area and the muscles to see the threshold for sensation and for abnormal sensation. Uh, we'll also look at the blood, and we're looking for these metabolomic changes and also the genetic uh, mentioned, uh, changes I mentioned. There are a number of questionnaires because we, at this point, this is our way of getting at um, mood, anxiety, the way you process information, and then a short diet diary, and then the MRI scan of the brain. For this, we do compensate you and pay for parking, and you actually get a picture of your brain. We are studying women between 18 and 55. The reason we had the uh, cutoff is because um, the brain does change over 55. And we are also comparing to women who do not have vulvodynia and sometimes to other pain conditions. And the repository that we have includes individuals under 55. Generally healthy, we do take a health history. Um, and no metal in your body, but dental work is generally OK. The metal aspect has to do with the MRI machine. OK, here's some examples. This is from some of the preliminary studies that we've been, done, we've been doing of what we call highways in the brain. So what are we looking at here? Why look at the, quote, highways? Looking at the connections between brain structures is one way to measure the brain in vulvodynia. And these connections are what we call the highways, and they actually signify the direction and the speed of flow of information between brain regions. Here's an example of some resting state brain images. What is resting state? That's where you're basically just lying in the MRI scanner. You're not sleeping, but you're also not doing a task. And there's no stimulation, for example. We're not stimulating pain in the vulvar area at this time. What we found in our preliminary studies is that women with vulvodynia compared with those who do not have vulvodynia show greater connectivity in an area called the sensory motor cortex, the sensory motor network. And what exactly is the sensory motor network? It receives sensory information or sensation from the periphery, meaning from the nerves in the vulvar area and the vagina. And perhaps other areas in the, in the periphery that's outside of the uh, central nervous system. And it plays an important role in body sensation awareness and also in the generation of appropriate motor responses. Motor is movement. So remember I talked about the pelvic floor muscles and the interesting connection here. Then we do something called structural brain imaging. 
And again, we find in our preliminary studies that these sensory motor regions were found to be significantly different in vulvodynia compared to unaffected women. So the studies are ongoing. We have many more um, what we call information points to uh, collect at this point. And if you're interested in the studies or any further information about vulvodynia, please, cut it, please contact our study coordinator. Here's the phone number. We also have an email address. And now I'd like to open this up to any questions that you might have using this hashtag noted here. Okay, the first question that we have is, how long is too long on estrogen? So I'm not sure whether this is coming from an individual who's using estrogen in the menopause or someone who is premenopausal. So estrogen has different effects at different stages in your life. And again, it depends on whether if you're in the menopausal years, if you have to take progesterone with it, because there's a difference between just estrogen alone or taking estrogen with progesterone. So there's no simple answer here, but if you happen to be in the menopause taking estrogen alone, it's thought that about 10 years is reasonable. Um, having said that, we can apply topical estrogen to the vaginal and vulvar area indefinitely. And as long as you don't have an estrogen-dependent cancer, for example, we can use topical approaches throughout the entire lifespan. And certainly in reproductive age women, there's no limit on, uh, on the duration of use of what we call ad additional estrogen or exogenous estrogen. Well, we have some individuals who have asked, well, will I have this condition for my entire life? And the answer is generally no. We do have effective treatments. Uh, is this going to be possibly a sensitive area for you, uh, a, a slightly vulnerable area? That may be the case. And this is why we're engaging in this kind of research, is basically so that we can find complete cures. So we do have ways of treating, I would say, at least 90% of individuals who can get to the point of not experiencing pain, having satisfactory sexual lives, and that's the basic goal of the treatment. It may be multidisciplinary. It may involve a number of approaches, but in the long run, we can manage this problem and we can um, get to the point of having no pain and comfortable, enjoyable sexual life. Uh, one other question we've been asked before uh, relate to types of birth control that may increase the risk of vulvodynia. So again, not everyone is susceptible. Millions of women worldwide use low-dose uh, hormonal contraceptives, um, and they do not have problems with vulvodynia. But the contraceptives that could slightly, I would say, if you already have vulvodynia, particularly vestibulodynia, we aim to have you discontinue the um, combined hormonal birth control pills and use something like an intrauterine device, for example. Even the intrauterine device that has hormone in it, the progestin-containing one, does not block your ovulation, does not block your estrogen and testosterone production from your ovaries. So that's an effective contraceptive that can be used. You need not just rely on condoms, for example. Um, but we would discontinue the hormonal medications that do suppress your own estrogen and androgen production if we determine that this is playing a role in your specific case, so not in, not in all individuals. There's also been a question, where can I find out more about vulvodynia? There is an organization called the National Vulvodynia Association, nva.org, and this organization has a wonderful website you can join nva.org uh, and you can see where, you, where there are local providers. You can get a newsletter updating you about all of the current research and you can also um, get information on how to help yourself if you have this problem. I have one more question. 
for estrogen treatment, what are the long-term side effects for cancer patients? Well, it depends on what type of cancer. Most cancers do not have estrogen receptors and are not bothered by estrogen. In fact, estrogen can be very good to take if you, for example, had chemotherapy and your own estrogen function is no longer with you. However, I think that the main situation we're talking about is breast cancer. Uh, even in situations where there isn't a hormone-positive breast cancer, oncologists are very reluctant for women to use estrogen. And in the first few years, up to the first five years after a diagnosis, usually estrogen cannot be used. However, that doesn't mean we can't uh, supplement the tissue with other types of agents. Some of these include oil-based. Um, coconut oil is very good for moisture. Lidocaine is very good still for any discomfort related to um, the tissues and continuing dilator use so the tissues uh, continue to have blood flow to that area. Um, there are some other uh, quasi-hormones that can be used, for example, DHEA, but that would depend on your cancer and your particular situation. Um, in terms of uh, endometrial or uterine cancer, this also may be a situation where for the first five years estrogen cannot be used. But other than that, uh, there are really very few cancers where estrogen cannot be supplemented, if not systemically, locally, which is highly effective. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for this webinar. And if you have any further questions, please feel free to join our, uh, to come to the OBGYN website at UCLA Health. Thank you.